will be about racist attacks in Germany. And our uh, moderator is Sharon Turkman. She will introduce the speakers, Bafta Zabu, Peggy Pirsch, Aurora Rodanoa is again with us uh, today because Aisha Gulesh will say hello through Skype to us, but she couldn't come to Berlin because of the storm and the trains were canceled in West Germany. So we will be we will having her hello and Aurora will take on, on, on the, her presentation. We wish you a very good panel, a very good time and lunch. I think I said that in the beginning, but just repeating it will be on the first floor here. We just go one uh, floor down at two. Okay, have a nice time. Ist an. Ähm, nachdem ich Abend, ähm, diese Konferenz in diesen Raum und ähm, euch verlassen habe, hatte ich ähm, ganz schöne ähm, Magenumdrehungen und ähm, ich habe mich tatsächlich erstmal gefragt und tatsächlich haben wir heute mit... Ähm, When I left the conference and this hall yesterday, I really felt very bad, my stomach was a little bit upset. Today, with these wonderful women at the panel and with my speakers here, I started uh, out by saying the following, we are very indebted to you. Thank you very much for you being here and sharing this space with us together and also for having stayed that long yesterday and sharing your critique, your analysis and your experience. This is a huge challenge for us to be up here at the front. Uh, we would love to have uh, shared the space differently and discuss with you directly. Therefore, I thank you, the audience, for being here and I'm very much looking forward to your contributions in your in our discussion later. Now, let's start with our panel. I'm very delighted that the International Women's Base has prepared this uh, conference. What I took out from the conference day yesterday is that what we have here is a very radical, political, however intimate space. I had a, somewhat a taste of the political vision, the idea of living together, how we as feminists, as international, transnational feminists, want to live actually in future, living together and working together and fighting together. My name is Jaren um, Turkum. I'm a sociologist and working on the fields of racism, anti-racism, migration, history, political migration research. And I'm currently w working at the Institute for sociology at the University of Gießen, where we are working very strongly on the topics that I mentioned uh, previously. I am very delighted to welcome our panelists, such as Peggy Pisha, thank you very much for being here, Bafta Sabo, and thank you to you too for being here, and also Pascal Alceglielch, thank you very much that you are here despite the storm. Pascal, it's unfortunately you are not here with us in person. However, you are here via Skype and can say hello to us and can also maybe join our discussion later on. Now, this panel will be moderated by me and I'm also going to give you an introduction into the topic. We're going to do things differently than yesterday. My, the panelists will introduce themselves they will talk about their struggles, their experience, and thus situating and positioning themselves. In the second round, we will then have short uh, inputs on the topic and hear what, has, what happened in the 1990s in Germany and how we can 
analyze this deathly racist violence in Germany and what kind of uh, knowledge we have now, especially after the experience with the NSU. And with all that, we will look at the we will look back at the 1990s and see what happened there. So we will look at the 1990s and reflect on them from today's position and try to find uh, an answer how we can really f fight uh, racism and uh, other issues. And uh, I'm really happy to be able to moderating this panel. Now, Peggy, I can't ask you to introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you very much, Saren, for this very friendly introduction. Let me start out by thanking the organizers of this conference. It's really impressive what you guys managed to organize. I would also like to thank the audience for having come and also um, creating the space here with us together. Let me just say a few introductory words. Uh, what, because I was asked to introduce myself, right? My name is Peggy Pische. I'm a literary and cultural scientist. I was born in the GDR and grew up in Thuringia. This is the oldest part of East Germany called Amstadt. It's somewhere near Erfurt and Weimar. Many of you don't know that little place that I grew up. In the GDR and also in the Federal Republic of Germany and also in the Soviet Union, these were, are the countries that I studied in. And the fall of the Berlin Wall was an event that I experienced as somebody who was socialized in East Germany, perhaps completely. When the fall of the Berlin Wall happened, I was uh, studying and, of course, um, I received that kind of GDR this. I want to say that graphic moment shapes a person. However, the East German socialization really shaped me very much, especially when it comes to my experience with black uh, feminism, and that made me the person who I am today. And it basically really shaped me, especially having gone to school in XGDI. I was asked to say something about the black feminists from the perspective of XGDR. No, no, this is something we're going to do in the second round, so let me pass on the mic to the next person. My name is Bafta. I too would like to thank the organizers for this event. Yesterday I had to work at another conference and was not able to take part here fully. However, I heard very great things about the first uh, conference day. So let me thank you once again for being here and also the invitation. Okay, let me introduce myself. My name is Bafta, as I said, and I'm studying s uh, sociology, political science in Berlin, and I grew up in Frankfurt am Main. I was Born in Delmenhorst, many of you won't know that place. It's a very small place in uh, Lower Saxony. But we left that small place very early because in the 1990s, racist violence and racist uh, organizations started to emerge. And for my mother, that was a reason to move to Frankfurt because there, there were a lot of migrants and racist violence did not play such a big role as where we came from. Now, I was happy not to be um, exposed to such racist violence when I grew up. I then moved to Berlin to study, and uh, the university was not full of migrants, really, and the need started to emerge to organize myself differently, to uh, engage in political organization uh, with people with the same 
experience. So I then joined the ISD, which is the Initiative of Black People in Germany. So this is the organization that I'm part of. My name is Aurora Rodono. Hello, Aisha. I am stepping in for Aisha. But yesterday, I actually uh, did not introduce myself. So let me introduce myself today. I am also a literary and cultural scientist. I grew up in Hesse, and I mentioned that very briefly. I grew up in a guest worker's family. My parents left uh, Sicily for Hesse in the 1960s, and I joined various projects and also was busy with that uh, topic. And in 2005, I w joined the project Migration Action which was the large-scale exhibition on labor migration after the Second World War. And during uh, that, I really worked very much on my own biography and also on the um, labor migration. Today, I am a lecturer at uh, a university in Germany and working on issues such as anti-racism, arts, uh, pedagogy, so I'm in the interface of practice, activism, and theory. And uh, this morning at uh, 6.30, Aisha sent me an SMS telling, uh, asking me to call her. I am part of the action group tribunal and is uh, dissolving the tribunal com uh, NSU complex together with Aisha and others. BAFTA was also part of that. We're about 100 people who in May this year made the NSU tribunal complex and there we basically wanted to look at racism in Germany together with um, the relatives of the victims. So Aisha, I now give the floor to you because you are the actual speaker. I'm very sad that I cannot be with you in person. Can you all hear me okay? It's absolutely fantastic that we are having a women's conference on the topic of racism. I, however, I also said that I cannot be with you in the same room. I really wish you a very successful conference day and I already heard that yesterday's conference day was quite moving and amazing and I'm also very sure that today's conference day will be the same. Let me just say th a little bit about myself. I live in Kassel. I am a daughter of uh, Turkish migrants. My father came in the early 1960s to Germany. My brother and my mother then followed him later. I grew up in Gelsenkirchen in the Ruhrgebiet in uh, North Rhine-Westphalia. For many years, my father worked as a mine worker. For a very long time, in the 1980s, I experienced the first racist attacks on the migrant l life. Ramazan Auja, I remember him very well. I also remember Jana Maya, who was a poet who was studying. She burned herself out of protest. I remember someone at um, burned herself in protest for the very vivid racism in Germany. These are experiences that I, or incidences that I also experienced as a child. In the 1990s, I was already in 
as a in castle i studied political sciences and it was a it was a time where we saw a lot of racist attacks on uh, buildings of migrants and also accommodation for refugees such as Solingen, Rebeck, Hoyerswerda, Solingen. Now, all these uh, attacks I followed very closely as a student, and these stories, of course, uh, were inscribed in our bodies, in our lives uh, back then. Very early, I started then to be at the interface of activism, theory, and practical work to work with art project, and I'm currently working at the Documenta 14 and working also in a cultural center here in Kassel. Let me say that Kassel, which is the city that I live, is the place where Hadi Jusrat was killed by the NSU uh, circle, who was the most recent killing. So it's a city where the NSU also executed somebody. This is the reason why I initiated the initiative, which is called 6th of April, because the killing uh, it happened on the 6th of April. But Kassel is also the place in connection with that killing when there was a big resistance where we had like the demonstration, no, not yet another victim. So the people took to the street and uh, and tried to bring their knowledge to the people. As has been said already, the initiatives after the NSU has been exposed, they came together and built the, and dissolving the NSU complex in order to give the relatives of the victim space to talk about their experience. Thank you very much for the introduction. Let's start our discussion and hear from the various struggles that we are part of in the past and now as well. Racist violence and racist attacks. Uh, this is what we are going to do today. We're going to analyze that. We're going to try to look at this because we all know that there's not a single racism or a single sexism. We uh, can actually talk about racisms and sexisms because we as women and people who are affected, especially s women showing solidarity, as uh, struggling solidarity, we are affected by these phenomena. Of course, there are also different objectives, demands, cultures that all have an impact on us. So Peggy will talk about the black feminism in Germany. Bafta will talk about racism in the 1990s. And as an ISD member, they joined the campaign. Let me just quickly look up uh, that uh, campaign, ban racial profiling and eradicating dangerous Places. So BAFTA will introduce two struggles from her organization and Aurora will talk about the campaign dissolving the NSU complex. Now I will start uh, with an introduction with, um, w with how we can understand racism and anti-racism, the struggles that are 
always also part of the racist new formulation and formation and consti constitution in Germany and y in Europe. And of course, racism is not static. Racism is always reforming itself and racism also is shaped is forced to change itself through our struggles. When I was born in the 1980s, in actually in 1980, my father himself was a Turkish guest worker who came in the 1970s to uh, Germany. We were LV uh, Turkish uh, migrants who migrated to Germany. I was born in the Rogerby, just like Aisha. And when my father started to work in the steel production at the furnace and to start casting and cutting steel, just as many other guest workers in Turkey, in the Rogerby, migrants back then were called by authorities, politics, and the media, foreign workers. Later, they were then called foreign employees. And then later, maybe at the end of the 1960s, at the early, and then maybe early 1970s, they were called guest workers. Aurora, in your panel, which you moderated yesterday, we heard that migration policy after 1973 changed after the state labor recruitment program in 1973 was officially ended. Guest workers were supposed to just leave. And those who wanted to leave, they also left. However, those who wanted and uh, to stay and uh, wanted to come came and stayed and uh, shaped that uh, life here with their migrant um, beingness. There were people also who came here who just did not want to accept living in war areas or live in poverty or where their lives are continuously threatened. In a book, in a, uh, uh, in a, a novel, there's a really beautiful quote I like on the idea of migration back then. We are citizens of this world. Therefore, we have the human right to um, live in dignity in where we want to establish our lives. When my mother started to work in the big companies of um, the Roger Beat as a cleaner, she was already called a foreign fellow citizen. So this was the language that, is, that was used for um, so-called foreigners. Now, this labeling or denomination reached up right into the 1990s. Now, in the 2000s, with the increasing nat nat nationalization processes, the expression German with migrant uh, background is the expression that established itself for the so-called migrants. So this is the expression that is existing today. We are now so-called Germans with migrant backgrounds. But at the same time, while these um, while migrants came through these recruitment uh, programs, there are also those who migrated to Germany to seek for political or economic asylum. So apart from guest workers, there was always the discussion about uh, asylum seekers and refugees. Now, the labeling or the name calling for migrants, and this is why I also showed you now that um, history of naming, these words or expressions are not just words. What they show is also political relations in or within the migration regime. And these political relations have two faces. On the one hand, on the Federal uh, Rep Republic, um, of Germany and the European regulation uh, authorities and the mm, transnational border regime authorities are the ones who are the one face who are really defining this um, expression because this migration regime has something to do with state power, which is trying to prevent 
and trying to regulate migration. Now, these political conditions have also another phase, which is beyond the state. These are the many political movements, the border crossings of migrants, their struggles, their solidarity, the self-organizing, the knowledge production, which we are also producing here, the analysis, the informal social networks, but also formal associations, which we have established which didn't exist before this is basically all the second phase of the uh, the second phase um, and migration politics is always contested our concrete practices and our visions l to live together on equal footing in a social migration society are part of this migration policy and also that of what we want to achieve the success of the AfD, the Party for Alternative Germany, shows that these struggles of us are our that our struggles are also a threat to the people because we are shaping this society, and this is also where the right wing shift that we've seen in our society is also um, pointing to. So it's basically a fight against us in a way. Now, these different labeling and domination, uh, denomination of us and the underlying um, immigration politics, there's another second important point that I want to raise here. A friend yesterday, Owen Deem, pointed out this issue by saying that we should look at our space in an intersectional way and these we cannot speak of a collective of migration. We ourselves are coming from different perspectives. We have different migration experiences. We are affected by racism differently. The collective migration does not exist. However, what we are trying to do is to create a migration collective through our different struggles and through spaces like today. And possibly, my migration experience as a child from um, workers was much more different than Peggy's experience who grew up in the ex-GDR. However, we are connected still and have uh, some kind of solidarity for one another. We are children of migrants who grew up at a time where migrants were not welcomed, where arson attacks were, uh, were, were carried out against migrants. We read back then Malcolm X, we read about Angela Davis, we looked at the racism analysis of the Black Power Movement in the USA. These were attempts to look at the experience of young people and thus generate some kind of knowledge for young people who were affected by racism. Now we come back to the 1990s and to the violence uh, in the 1990s, and that takes us right into the topic of our panel. So let's start our discussion. What happened in the 1990s? The 1990s were a very dark phase. We saw arson attacks, we saw racist attacks and deaths, and a systematic state failure. Indeed, after that, we saw a racism that was carried and supported by the society, a institutional racism. For example, the asylum law was eradicated in 1992, two years after the first uh, deadly arson attack in Hoyerswerda. One year later, we saw an attack, uh, the attack in Rostock 
Lichtenhagen. And later, we saw the arson attack in Mölln. Three women were killed uh, during that arson attack. This attack took place in West Germany in 1992 after reunification, just something I want to mention. Another arson attack happened a year later in Solingen. That what was so horrible and that what we cannot imagine today, after Merm's arson attack in 1992, the former chancellor, Helmut Kohl, and Helmut Kohl was invited to the memorial service because there was a demonstration group that formed, uh, like a migrant group that formed uh, a light a chain was um, was um, created. And that what is so marking about racism and the connection between everyday racism and migration policy, what became very apparent was the uh, words of Helmut Kohl, he sent his representative, uh, his representative to the memorial service to Mölln, stating that so basically he stated that he does not want to have a mourning tourism. It basically means that the chancellor did not go to the memorial service. What we saw in the 1990s, we saw attacks against migrants and politicians, especially in the face of the very controversial asylum law and also having the uh, looking at the what was happening there and where we saw a r the reverse of perpetrator and victim, we heard from politicians saying that we have too many foreigners. This is no longer sustainable for our society. So the perpetrator victim uh, role was then reversed, just like the way we see it today in right-wing populist discourses. The 1990s were the years also where many migrant organizations uh, uh, were established, where many migrant struggles uh, started to emerge. In the 1990s, we also started to speak very clearly about racism Everything that what has been seen until then as xenophobia or was debated as such, through the struggles and through the collective analysis in the 1990s was then called racism. In this connection, it, the, it was important to have these transnational discourses. So we looked at the discussions in England. We looked at the knowledge that was existing in the USA and their struggles there. And through integrating all this, we tried then to develop an analysis that would maybe do justice to the experience of migrants here in the society. There are two points I would like to mention. Despite the fact that these uh, arson attacks uh, happened, or that two arson attacks happened in West Germany, the left narrative often says that the 1990s, when it comes to racism, we saw a breakthrough. Asia mentioned the the suicide of Ashram, who, the, the woman who uh, burnt herself. So let's not forget that attacks did not only happen in East Germany, they also happened in West Germany. And let's also not forget that racism also, or racist attacks also happened uh, in the 1980s and much, much earlier. Now the 1980s compared to the 1990s are still very silent. We should also start really digging up and look at what happened in the 1980s.
And also look at how racism against migrants in the 1980s then developed in the racism that we then saw in the 1990s. Now, the NSU complex is absolutely important for the 1990s because the perpetrators of the NSU killings were socialized in the um, 1990s. And they then, so these racist killings then um, can be seen basically as something that emerged much, much earlier in the history of Germany. Now, that is my part. Now, Peggy, when it comes to racism, and we look at racism at a state like Germany, an anti-fascist uh, country, how did racism look like? How did you guys organize yourself? Yeah, vielen Dank. Uh, um, Thank you very much. Well, these are these were heavy times. Uh, looking back to it is not easy. I'm trying to actually to package it in a way that will be also empowering. As I was asked to take part in this conference and to make a contribution, I took a deep breath. What shall I say about this? Of course, I can use a historical perspective on the topic of racism in the German Democratic Republic. But actually, I migrated from Ashtar to Berlin. And that is my migrant background, no more. I have to say it very clearly. You gave some hints already. We have different positions. We have different struggles. And you have also different biographies. And maybe we have a different ways of apprehending Germany altogether. Part of my collective struggle is to get rid of this idea of migrant background, because it's a kind of characteristic that is assigned to us. And if we talk about the third or fourth generations, as I said, we have a diff different positions, meaning we have different levels of privileges and difficult, different levels of access. I have a privilege accept, access because of my citizenship, but still, I, it is also impacted by the idea of this migrant, so-called migrant background. So in terms of positioning ourselves and in terms of uh, definition in society, there is a division between you and us, and here is has to do with this country. Of course, I will never, I will respect everybody's right to self-definition, but I want to just underline the fact that uh, at this moment of time, we have to question and adapt any kind of concept and focus on our vision. And what is really entrenched in black feminism is this diversity and plurality of perspectives in a pluralistic society. And this pluralistic society is based on self-definitions. And what I associate with uh, this concept of uh, migrant background is that actually Germany is supposed to be a white society. 
So this is the channel through which I see things. When I came to Germany, there's something, of course, fantastic, because as queer, black, German feminists, with all the labeling and all the concepts, I had to find an answer that is really deeply anchored in this, in that time. And that was, as I said, after the fall of the war, German reunification. And I found myself in a reunited Germany. This is my way to Germany, so to say. And at that time, I had to reflect and to learn a lot about my own positioning. I would say that my coming out as well as what I found after, as I was part of a large uh, black community, I could enter it, and my coming out uh, is a queer coming out, and as well, a black coming out. So it's a double coming out, because my b blackness is also a, a, a coming out. And in the German, in the East, East Germany, I couldn't voice it. There was no expression for it. Of course, there are racist wordings there as well as, uh, as in West Germany. But in terms of positioning, in a position of uh, power, I needed a black collective in order to come out as a black and queer person. I grew up with this anti-colonial black struggle at international level and even I would say more maybe others should judge uh, ju just uh, if assess it even maybe more and in 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 West Germany with this dimension of international solidarity I grew up with this campaign aiming at freeing Angela Davis with the postcards that we wrote to addressed to Angela Davis, who was detained. So I've got to know the uh, friends personally. We talked about it. Uh, and maybe that one of my postcards may have reached out. She talked several times uh, about it, how important it was uh, to her. And she said before she knew my biography, she, saw, she said it in her speeches because it's made it visible, something, especially the postcard that were the massively sent to her. It showed that she had a visibility at international level. I come from a state that found it very important to have a stand in terms of uh, supporting and pushing the struggle, the anti-colonial struggle, and to give it, give it a visibility later on and what uh, again and again you, we had also this free Nelson Mandela campaign that was also a movement there was l literature and uh, also novel that were translated much earlier in the, in the East Germany compared to West Germany and we and many of the people from Western Germany came to East Germany and exchanged very quickly their, their, their strong uh, currency against very good translated n books in, from East Germany. And my first identity, uh, my first steps in, in the identification process was through a book. I read it in uh, the bath of, uh, of my grandparents. That is, that was the only place when the music from Kroos and Cancer didn't, uh, didn't, uh, was uh, fooling the place. That is the first book I, I read. And if I didn't say in everything, the typical youth books, Frank and Irene, Frank the Capitaine, that, these are the real title, you can check it. These were the title of the youth books. And my grandma uh, was really worried. 
she said the, the child doesn't read. Later, I studied literature, so at also roots, I've, I've just swallowed it. And I understood that I'm really deeply anchored in a transnational history. And I couldn't say the words, but I felt it. That was this kind of a range of activities and phenomena that I found in East Germany. The problem was the speechlessness. I mean, in that was something that uh, that showed itself as well in everyday racism. There was no word for it. Racism that comes from the from Western uh, countries. This is what we could see on television. Uh, Carl Edward von Schlitzer on the Black Channel. How oh, terrible! How terrible was the the was Western Germany? This is the way we were taught. So what we experienced, there was no word for it, meaning that I couldn't have words to describe the blackness positively. But because of the anchorage of uh, the international anchorage of uh, East Germany, with the linkage to other states in Asia and uh, other states and uh, Africa, and le to the struggles of the black uh, of uh, of uh, the black power uh, movement or Asia, and suddenly you were you could see a guest worker. And uh, it was portrayed as something very positive, but actually it was not uh, true. But the, for, to this, there was also no words. So this wide range of uh, phenomena was still, was East Germany still a European country uh, where racism was supposedly only a phenomena coming from Western Germany. It didn't really actually disturb. There was a way to arrange oneself with this kind of situation. Yes, uh, this uh, very dirty com communism was uh, uh, portrayed as such. Yes, we have some problems, but uh, we don't have. We, we are not dirty communism and uh, dirty communists. And in East uh, Germany, we said, "Okay, we have no this dirty system. We have problems, but we are communists." And I wanted to also underline this dimension. If, even if I was uh, supposed to talk more about the 80s, the, the verbalization of my own identity came after 1980 because I could find a black feminist collective. And they had already fought for, work, for concepts. For instance, uh, the concept of Afro-Germans and also being lesbian, being queer, and they are also created space for that. I was very lucky to find Adefra, and I see here at least two women who created, who initiated Adefra, Yasmin, and a colleague. You can raise your hands. Ria, and uh, Ria always, uh, gave me such a look when I do that, but I will, car I will carry on. But I said, as the example with uh, Angela Davis showed, it is all about visibility. So I could find words as well in this collective for things that were deeply connected to my history, to my story, but uh, embedded in a collective dimension, Adefra, as uh, organizations of queer, but we went where who 
were created in the 80s and who developed as well and, and was part of many, many struggles and where we also grew up and matured had also embedded his uh, struggle in the international, in an international collective in the Netherlands, in the UK, in the USA. And that was really necessary at that time in the, in the, 80, in the 80s because of the positioning of Germany. At that time, Germany decided to focus its identity on whiteness. May it be West Germany or East Germany were marginalizing, marginalizing everything that had to do with migrant background. That was the time when we became a migrant background, though at, at that time I migrated, as I said, from Erfurt to Tübingen in order to study. And at that time, there were slogans, Germans, uh, Germany to the Germans, and we know the rest. I don't have to repeat it. And meaning that it was completely excluding us. That was the time where we didn't only understand it, when that, all that was embedded in a transnational movement. And this was the source of our employment. And this is a very important point as well. My colleagues will say more about the, the eight, nine years. I can also add something to it. But what is very important to me is to uh, stress the point. The, my own story is connected to that. We were always, you know, part of a whole movement. Our story doesn't start with us. There were wonderful sisters who did also their part. And it's very important to underline this. Um, exactly. The fact that we have a space here is built, is, is, is the is also part of this movement because a foundation was laid before and it's very important to emphasize it. What I've found in this organization of black feminists and black theory, theory the, I'm so th grateful, thankful. It's so, it was important. It's not easy to arrive in Germany. As I said, I'm migrated from Erfurt to Tübingen and from Tübingen to Berlin, and I was also in, in several other countries. And these ways of arriving, settling, I will never reach that point because this is something that is not meant for us. But what we can do is to create spaces, and these spaces are transforming Germany. And this is something that is exactly my aim, not to just uh, chase any kind of labels and to say, now I've arrived, but to find these spaces, to identify them, to create these spaces when we feel at ease, when we feel well, and when we have, we can, we can have this power of transformation. And when we can label, so to say, our biography in such a way that visibility there that we are in a plural society. I should say a tale about racism in the in the in the nineties. I think this is something, the time is limited to all, for all of us. But I will start with the 90s and to say a few words about the beginning of all. Looking back to the 70s, actually, as a kind of starting point, yesterday there was a whole panel about guest workers. Oh, I should slow down. Oh, sorry.
Okay, the 70s, I was talking about the 70s. So 72, you have two, the, two, uh, the 2 billion guest worker came and he was welcomed by Minister Bloom with uh, champagne and whatever. And that was, uh, he was welcome at that time. And 73, there was uh, this uh, recruitment stop and the hope from the side of uh, German politics that the people will return and that didn't take place. At the, on the contrary, more migrants came and more migrants actually grew up in Germany. And what happened also in 1973, there was the oil shock. Germany was uh, shaken by a deep economic crisis. And we know that uh, this uh, economic uh, growth has been uh, the fruit of the work of the guest workers to a great extent. There was also a wave of refugees. So you have this co these two phenomena, these uh, more uh, migrants at the same time that this economic crisis came meaning that some people were blamed, I mean, the migrants were blamed for the situation. And uh, people so in the 80s, we've heard you have a major wave of um, racist attacks, as especially in Western Germany. Ramazan Ashvi was mentioned in Hamburg. There were also several racist attacks. You had the attack, serious attack at the um, October 1st. Um, the Hoffman group, they were not uh, an individual, they were really groups, so right-wing organizations. And what developed as well were a racist narrative that the boat is full. What happened as well? If the, the misuse of the asylum the right of asylum. That was also the case before the 90s. There were restrictions on the granting of uh, asylum. May it be in in Bavaria with the Republicans as parties. So these kind of groups, right-wing groups, which were spreading and mobilizing as well racist discourse. It is a similar situation now. There was a increasing occurrence of racist pogroms against uh, asylum in Lübeck, uh, in Solingen. There were major solidarity movements, for instance, lights, chains, but also a radical resistance from the migrants, anti-fascist migrant youth were organized, uh, organizing and uh, mobilizing against racist and fascist violence. And what about the relations of the politicians? N 1993, that is actually the end of the right of asylum, which could only go through two-third majority at parliament. That is uh, with a majority of uh, CSU, CSU, SPD, so the Social Democrats, the Christian Democrats, which means that is a, a 
de facto the abolition of the rate of asylum and the so-called third uh, country system with the so-called safe uh, countries and with the also airports in uh, Frankfurt the a group there the airport is, is portrayed as uh, a place why Frankfurt is so open to the world, but actually this is the place where people are deported in a very shortened kind of procedure. And the abolition de facto of the status of uh, war refugees. Oh, the, there is also a similar situation to nowadays, is a repetition actually of history, so to say. But that was the situation in terms of racism in the 90s in West Germany. In terms of discourses, it was not actually brought to place. People were actually looking rather to East Germany. The people, what the people were blamed were the were frustrated East Germans after. Reunification, nobody was actually really talking about violence in the 80s. That is before reunification. The reunification was probably fostering violence. But in West Germany in the 80s, as I say, there were also racist narrative and racist violence against migrants. Now, this continuity that are existing is also shown at the example of the NSU. And Aisha, I wanted to ask you whether you want to give us an introduction and want to, to say something about the video, or should I, should I do that? I think we're having some technical problems. Let me continue then. Indeed, we do see these continuities. It looks like Aisha is able to continue and give us an introduction. Unfortunately, the sound is not that good. So uh, it's not working. We do. We are having technical problems. So. Now let me continue. In the 1990s, or the 1990s, show that NSU, which is the abbreviation for the Nazi Socialist Union. Now, we have different cells that emerge, uh, and they, different groups, then form the NSU, the Nationalist uh, Socialist uh, Underground, and we see it as an NSU complex. Aisha spoke about the demonstration. Despite having the mo uh, mo murder series of, an, of the NSU, there's also the resistance among the migrants. One family who is working together with the initiative, the 6th of April, they are fighting against racism, and that is the family of Haliet Jossad. We want to show you a video that shows the demonstration with the banner, No More Victims. This is a demonstration from 2006 and happened just shortly after the killing on the 6th of April 2006. Die Übersetzung der Rede von Hal 
This is the translation of Harriet's father, Ekshmar Schnorschalt. So this is the translated speech. Let's see whether it's in English or German. Ladies and gentlemen, my only son, Harriet Zossan. Oh, you can see the English um, subtitles on the screen. Now, this was a short clip of the speech of Ishan Rashad, a father who is mourning the death of his uh, child. And at the same time, he expresses a lot of strength because he's saying no more victims. And he's calling on the Saudaji community to fight against racism. Let me read the contribution of Aicha Gulud. In 19... 98, three members of the so-called National Socialist Underground are going underground. Until their self-exposure, the so-called uh, public exposure, they killed nine people with Turkish, Kurdish, and Greek names. They killed these people in Nuremberg, Munich, Rostock, Hamburg, Dortmund, and also Kassel. And they did that on day broad light. Uh, during their business. They had a uh, like, uh, tailoring shop, they had a luxmith uh, business, a vegetable business, or even a takeaway business or an internet cafe. These are all public spa uh, places in very busy roads and busy quarters. These people were all self-employed businessmen, and they had their businesses in neighborhoods where migration is shaping the urban space. Places and people who themselves or their parents and grandparents came as guest workers to Germany and tried to um, organize a life for themselves here. Also, a policewoman was killed. In addition, the NSU, which uh, carried out at least three bomb attacks and two of them in Cologne. In the Korbstrasse in Cologne, on the 9th of June 2004, a nail bomb was placed before the barber shop of the brother Siderim and was ignited. The intention was to kill as many people as possible. In the stories of the people that we met uh, from the Koib Street, they are highlighting the fact that it is a miracle that nobody died, but only some people who survived with serious injuries. They also talk about the bomb after the bomb, which was even worse than the 10 centimeter long nail of the first bomb. With a bomb after the bomb, they referred to the period where they were treated like uh, perpetrators and not victims. And this second bomb was even more painful for them. 
We mourn the de the those who have died. We mourn Edward Simicek. He was killed on the 9th of September 2000 in Nuremberg at his flower shop. That day, he was standing in for his colleague. Two years later, he died from his injuries in the hospital. We also mourn Abduriam Uzudoro. He was killed on the 13th of June 2001, also in Nuremberg, and he was currently at his tailoring business, and he was killed with two gunshots in his head. The business he established together with his wife, and he was also holding down a full-time job as a shift worker at Siemens. We also mourn Suleiman Tashtishtek. Fourteen days later, he was killed in Hamburg with three gunshots on his head. He was killed in the vegetable shop of his father. The father had just stepped out for a short time to get olives. When he came back, he saw how two white German men left the shop. The father found his son in a pool of blood and took the dying man in his arms. We also mourn Habil Kilic. Two months later, he was killed in Munich in his uh, grocery shop. He was killed by two gunshots in his head. He too was just replacing his wife while she was on holiday. The blood pool was then cleaned by his wife when she came back from holidays. She then closed the shop. We also mourn Mehmet Tugut, who was called Memo. He was killed on the 25th of February 2004 in a Rostock takeaway shop. At that time, he had just come to Rostock recently in order to help his relatives. We also mourn Ismail Rasha. He was working at the takeaway shop in Nuremberg when he was killed on the 9th of June 2005. He was killed by two gunshots in his head and two further shots on the upper part of his body. We also mourn Theodorus Bulgaridis. He was killed six days later in Munich in, the sh in his locksmith business. Now, the letter of the renovation was still in the business because he had just opened the business two weeks uh, prior. We also mourn Mahmed Kubacek. He was killed on the 4th of April 2006 in his takeaway shop in Dortmund. The perpetrators shot him four times in his head, and he just also stepped in that morning uh, from his wife to help out. You also mourn Hali Josuat. Two days later, on the 6th of April 2006, he was killed in Kassel in his internet uh, cafe. Now, a few minutes later, his father came to um, step in because Halid had to go to the evening school. He fa the father found his son uh, alive uh, at the store counter, but he died in the arms of his father. He was 21 years old. Now, after every murder, the families were suspected. Politicians, police, and the media spoke about the sober parallel world and organized crime. The investigative um, officers pursued those who were mourning. They listened to their telephone conversation. They put them under pressure. They defamed them and accused them. The investigative officers even traveled to Turkey to find out what they actually couldn't find out there anyway. Now, the NSU did not um, act on its own and was not an isolated terror cell. It had many supporters. It was enabled through the racist and ignorant climate in Germany. Explicit, which was explicitly supported since the 1980s by the media, by academia, and politics. After the murder of Halid, the youngest and last murder in Kassel, the relatives of Enfa Simishek, Mehmet Kubacek, and Halid Sogat organized two demonstrations, first in Kassel and later in Dortmund. Now, the three families until then were not in touch. The driving force were, of course, maybe the women, the mothers, the daughters of those who were killed. They talked about the social or public ignorance. They called for being heard and also for the pain to be made aware of. 
a pain which you feel when you've lost your child, your son, or even your father or husband. 4,000 uh, people, mostly from migrant communities, called on the day to stop the murdering, to name the names of the perpetrators and arrest them. Nevertheless, the critical public ignored this visible protest. Also from the stories of the people affected, we know that the NSU did not act in an isolated way. With the term NSU complex, we refer to the fact that it's a bigger circle involved. The NSU complex is more than just the three, the, the trial or those three people who are accused and currently on trial in Munich. Therefore, the NSU complex is a combination of neo-Nazi violence the, of the group that uh, called itself NSU and the institutionalized structural racism. The NSU complex expresses itself in the reversal of victim-perpetrator role. It expresses itself in racist media coverage, in the links of the German uh, secret service to the right-wing extremist scene, and so-called Nazis, the employees at the protection of, who are working for the protection of the Constitution. It also expresses itself in the attempts to cover up uh, information, to um, let also evidence material disappear, and also the unaccounted deaths. Now, the NSU was unable to the racist and ignorant climate here in Germany, which was explicitly propped up since the 1980s by the media, academia, and politics, as I said earlier. Exemplary for that is the historian debate or the Heidelberger Manifest, what who talked about the infiltration of the German people and also the so-called too many, the phenomena of too many foreigners. Or the expression says that the boat is full. That term was uh, coined at a time when the repatriation bonuses were introduced um, for the first generation of guest workers. In the 1990s, the silence became more. We saw arson attacks and the racist mob took to the streets. The NSU trial at a time of Rostock, Lichtenhagen, Mölln, Zollingen, Lübeck, on Hoyas Veda, it radicalized itself. Aber, but there were there was always resistance and solidarity. There have always been people who were active and committed and found new forms and uh, linked up in their struggles and showed and acted against racism and clearly said, we are here, we exist. Ich werde jetzt noch kurz ergänzen. Now, as part of the tribunal NSU complex, which took place in Cologne, there are various formats to, in order to formulate the action and also to formulate the uh, uh, demands of the relatives. There was also a artistic intervention, which were presented by the so-called spots of uh, various artists were invited. Artists were also activists. We saw uh, they were invited to do film contributions and to really um, show uh, artistic interventions against a narrative that is racist. And I want to show you one spot, a spot called Against Randomness. It's a two and a half minute spot. There are about 20 spots. Uh, these are audiovisual interventions which you can access online. So just go to, uh, to the web page spots international. Hikaye anlatmak, hayatın rastlantısallığına karşı bir direniştir. Hmm. 
Rastlantı sağlık kelimesi kaldı aklımda. Hayatımızı hikayelendirmek. Rastlantı sağlığa karşı. Fotoğraflara bakıyorum. Peki ya geçmiş zaman? Henüz değil. Fotoğraflara bakıyorum. Dükkanında ailesiyle birlikte bir bakkal. Kameraya gülümsüyor. Mutlu gözüküyor. Ona bakmak acıtıyor. Mutlu bir insanın yüzüne bakmak. Silindiği zaman kaybolmuyor. Bir iz bırakıyor. Ve o iz Hikaye ile birlikte taşınıyor. Başka bir ailenin fotoğrafları. Polis tarafından 10 yıldır alıkonulmuş. Görmedim. Hatırlamıyorum. Unuttum. Değil. Hayır, hayır, hayır değil. Hepimiz gördük. Hepimiz hatırlıyoruz. Ve hiçbir zaman unutmayacağız. Acı tanındığında, yasımızı tutabildiğimizde, hikayelerimizi anlatabildiğimizde, hem geçmiş, hem gelecek mümkün olacak. In all diesen Beiträgen in all these contributions during the triple norm. Everything was available, demonstration, debates, theater, films, exchanges. And that was, the focus was the migrant perspective. And this is why these uh, visual intervention have to be understood. It is another discourse, another art of storytelling, where the knowledge of people who have experienced racism is the core. Asher says always, that is the voice that is always the almost silent. That is the same in Bavaria, in, Mu in Munich. These are the voices that are, have become louder. Thank you for your contribution, for your input. There's something that struck my, me, my mind. We have two topics that came always, that were recurrent. What you said, Peggy, and what you made also more visible. The invisibility of our position and migrant knows know how racism is taking shape and what institutional racism is all about. And at the same time you have a space at state level where this perspective always mute is almost mute, is made silent. You talk about this position in the in East Germany where the the way black women were confronted with the idea of developing their own concepts, their own language. And in the contributions, that was stressed, we fought. And the struggle that were already available, the str struggle didn't start yesterday. Through this struggle, 
we have acquired and developed language and also knowledge. After the NSO's complex, why are we still confronted with the situation when you have a growing AFD movement going as well in the mainstream of society? And we have these arguments that are always put forward even in left-wing circles, in the social democrat circles, the boat is full. We have capacity that are already no longer available. We know the struggles, we know the narrative, and we have already our own concepts. So how is it possible that today we are still confronted with this kind of policy? That is my question to you. So is it, why is it so that racial profiling, that the criminalization of n newly arrived refugees are still is still ongoing? How is it? Why is it that it is still institutionalized at the police co level that this racial profiling policy is still? available despite this campaign banned racial profiling why is it that the knowledge that uh, migrants have acquired are s is still just uh, marginalized made invisible maybe a few words about the campaign because because maybe not everybody is familiar with this con concept or with the campaign. Although this campaign is supported by many different anti-racist organizations, the main objective is to target the practices of racial profiling in Germany. There is a difference between this practice in Germany and in the USA, for instance. This is a practice that is racist, and that is uh, something that maybe many people are familiar with. The police in Germany identify so-called dangerous spots, that is, uh, spots where th there is supposedly a lot of criminality, when people who are illegalized find themselves, and this is why they are under general suspicion. This is why their identity is checked. In Berlin, you have the Cottbusator as one of these spots, Galliser Park, Alexanderplatz, Warschauer Straße, and Kofersundam. These are these area, areas, and these areas are known because of uh, civil society's actions. Anti-racist organizations have acted for years to make these areas known. The police refused to disclose this, the name of these areas, and it was possible to disclose them thanks to the action of the left, we, the so-called left party, I mean the left party, the D. Lincoln, under the pressure of anti-racist organizations. You have a profi profile young men who look like foreigners. This is really a general description, very general description. But in the practice, the, it remains as well very general. And there should be a expert report led by this campaign. There should be a judicial decision in order to check whether this kind of practice is not a violation of the constitution of the basic law, German basic law, on the ground of racism. The reason why practices like Profi racist profiling are still used 
despite the knowledge acquired and put forward by anti-racist organizations. But we have seen what has, happening, has happened during the NSU tribunal. It's due to several things. On the one hand, this knowledge that has been acquired has led to positive changes, what I've noticed with this uh, identification or disclosure of these areas. Before, as I said, it was a secret kept by the police. There was some idea that the, these areas was uh, marked in a very particular way because of the number of uh, police controls. But now they have been localized publicly and we have to know what to do with this knowledge. And these are the positive changes and the successes that is uh, the fruit of our work. Of course, we have this knowledge. And there's an accumulation of this knowledge acquired and accumulated by people who have been confronted with uh, racist practice, but it, these practices have never been acknowledged at state level. We know that it was something that uh, was already available in the 1990s in Merle with, this, with NSU, with the, all the pol pra police practice blaming the victims e and uh, leading this investigation in a completely racist orientation, according to a completely racist orientation. And I think that, especially in connection with racial profiling, when the whole issue is also safety, we have to ask oneself, or ask ourselves, which kind of safety it's all about to question these concepts of safety and what is the state responsible for. When we have a look at racial profiling, you s can see that it clearly appears that the state doesn't feel responsible for the safety of people who are targeted by racial profiling. And for us, as anti-racist groups, we have to question the role of the state and analyze, analyze as well the role of the state in all these uh, aspects of racism. This is what uh, I can hear from what we are saying. Following your contribution, Aurora, or your contributions, Aisha, you're with us. I'm asking myself in a very intensive way, how is it possible for us as activists, in view of this NSU complex, to move forward? You have uh, really made a deep analysis of the NSU and, uh, and in the 90s. So what is your assessment? What about this situation in uh, from 2000 till uh, up to up today in Europe and in the USA, what about the evolution of racism? Aisha? Du solltest da sein, du kannst sprechen. Es geht leider nicht technisch. Es tut mir leid. <lacht> ähm, Aurora, du machst weiter? Es ist natürlich schwierig. Prognosen abzugeben, aber wir können sehr viel von der Geschichte lernen. Und was sich eben gerade am Beispiel des NSU zeigt, 
ist, dass es so etwas wie eine Geschichte des Rassismus gibt und dass es eine Systematik gibt, die eine bestimmte Tradition that we have a systematic racism we have systematic racism whenever whenever migrants want something there was a backlist the 1990s with the program are a good example that after people fought a lot and we heard about the struggles in the 1970s the rights to stay and all these other struggles that it that is always followed by a backlash and this is something that we can observe so there's no progress in a linear way that everything will be good there's always the attack however there's also the resistance that lies within the attack and that what is different today than in the 1990s the, the Sonnenblum house the Rostock Lichtenhagen when people the onlookers were applauding unfortunately we do still have that today there's still a huge support from the larger majority nevertheless the resistance has become bigger and this is what we try to show with the tribunal. On the one hand, we can be critical by conducting an analysis of the state and maybe trying to tune things down. However, on the other side, as activists, we can try to increase the pressure. If there is an imbalance in the uh, in the society and in the history. We might be able to push away something. However, racism as such, we won't be able to abolish. But we can make our voices stronger. We can make sure that we become bigger and that our so voices of solidarity are heard more. And why? Coming back to your question of how could it be that despite the knowledge that exists, that we still have racism, well, racism is or shows a societal relation that goes beyond the ideology. It's a, 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 a complex phenomena that involves the state, the politics, the science, academia, etc. And this is also something that has grown historically as well, especially when we look at the NSU media coverage. We they spoke about the so-called kebab uh, killings, etc. And this is what we need to fight, really. We, in schools, in all institutions, in all contexts that we are involved in, our history, our knowledge about racism, this is what we, what we need to tune up and become more in order to get that kind of balance. And maybe slowly, slowly things can change on the long run. But nevertheless, just like the traumata, all this redefinition requires also s several generations. Today, we see something different than maybe in the 1970s and 80s. We see more resistance, but in the same dimension, we still see racism being there. I have another question, Peggy. You talked about this uh, reversal of the but it is of girls, of responsibility the East Germany was anti-capitalist, anti-fascist, anti-racist, and uh, and they blamed Germany, Western Germany, for being fascist and uh, whatever, and racist and uh, capitalist. And it was the same that happened from the from West Germany to towards East Germany. But you talk about black. Feminism. Apart from the status quo in East Germany, how did you see and how did you observe this pogrom in West Germany? What did you think about what was happening in West Germany with the guest workers? What was your reflections about it? You mean before?
Well, the arguments I would put forward, I think that we have a, to, to uh, have a change of perspective, to shift the perspective when we analyze history. When we analyze history, we have to see it from the perspective of violence in order to for violence to be visible. And uh, sometimes we the observe violence and then you put a smile on your lips. So this should not be happened. We need to a kind of recollection from the perspective of resistance. The fact that we are sitting all here, that we discuss about it, it is connected to the movement, to the work of activists, to pol collective political work that have been developing since the post-war time in both countries and after the 1990s, it also had a new momentum after the fall of the Berlin War. So I would say that, or is it still possible today? It is possible because there's a will, because systemic racism is still advancing within a racist society and is upheld by this racist society and cannot abolish itself just like this. And that this means too that there is no that the level of integration in brackets that we would develop doesn't have an impact. This is not the point. It is not what matters, meaning that we have to really shift this perspective, change this perspective. We are here, and we are going to stay here, and we have been here for quite a while, and we will still be here, but we are not running after anything what is not actually wanted. Because it's the way it's everything, rep it, uh, the way this uh, Institutionalized racism reproduces itself, targeting the anti-racist movement. We could see after Rostock, there was not a major debate within, this, within society to reflect on the level of violence that was put to light. The racist laws were reinforced after this upsurge of right-wing groups that we are experiencing now, and we have to locate it very precisely, we have not talked about what kind of wrong orientation our uh, society is taken on. But we talk about the upper limit, Obergrenze in German, and we try to have never seen anybody else except themselves, to actually to go in that direction so that they actually do not see anybody else but themselves. When we are look at it like this, this is not a society I'm running after, definitely not. I'm not anxious to develop this kind of society. So this is why we have to unclose, to disclose, to reveal to the public what happened in this NSU pro complex. And this happened in a very empowering way, in a beautiful way. And that is the aim of our, one of the aims of our, com our community. It doesn't mean that uh, we're going to overcome systemic racism tomorrow. But we reinforce ourselves and in the movement and we contribute to it and that is the point and that is what matters. And I think that your 
and answer has to do with what black feminism, for black feminist theories also does as uh, a kind of uh, possibility, reinforcing empowering our own community, passing on the knowledge that was acquired, and this anxiety to acquire this la knowledge, to recapture this, la the, this knowledge that was before us, and that has been developed before our time, and to add to it so that we also be, be able to pass it on to the next generation. And of course, there's a lot of disappointment. And the, the, also the, all the, the strength that is needed to stand up every morning and to work to, on the path of development and to be confronted with any kind of newspaper or to any kind of statement on the street, but we're still there and we are of course, asking ourselves every day, what is the point of it? When we, t w even if we shift perspective, does it mean anything? Does it have any kind of uh, impact? But this is the way we continue. That is a continuation in our struggle. So, how was it in East Germany? How was it after the fall of the Berlin Wall? What about our resistance? An, offi an official accusation of uh, racism was not on the agenda because you cannot name something that is supposed not to be existing altogether. So there was no denunciation, public denunciation of uh, racism. There was a strong movement of contract workers. They formed strong movement. Officially, it was not supposed to be. They sh were not supposed to exist outside the scope of the this free trade union federation. That is the Trade Union Federation of the of East Germany. But this is a very important thing that it they, this type of organizations exists existed. And in my own biography, in my stories, in my story, I found my way. As I said, within a collective consciousness. Uh, it's a, you know, uh, sometimes I wonder how I could find, I uh, define this little kind of uh, tubing and sh s swap area. But it that was possible because I was looking for it. If I had looked in another direction, what the, if I had only focused on what this beautiful state was uh, offering to me, which kind of uh, anti-racist work was offering it to me, then I would not have found a, a different, and this is a very important point. Okay, thank you very much. Given that uh, we are running out of time, let's start our discussion and um, enter into dialogue with the audience. Okay, let me just remind you, before your intervention, just say the language that you're going to do your intervention in. I want to mention the killing of Uri Jalo. This has been an institutional killing which we should not forget. It was supported by the state, the judge, the media, the police, Everybody tried to cover up the murder. This year, in 2017, the trial was suspended. Despite the efforts of 
the family of the deceased, the trial was nevertheless suspended. It is good that we are showing solidarity with the victims of the people, with the relatives of the victims. Racist politics, this is what shapes the society. And as long as we have, we're not doing anything seriously against this kind of uh, politics, the society will continue to be racist and racism which has now reached in the broader society, as we see with the uprise of IFD, we will continue to have racism. After the Cold War and after this competition between socialism and capitalism, since all that has been uh, passed, we seem to be living in a one-dimensional world that requires bravery and organization, and also requires that we stand together across all specter as teachers, journalists, everybody. We should come together and fight against that uh, type of politics that we see. Things are even going to get worse. The future of this country does not look very brightly. Th this anti-racism has even divided the EU. It started in the Netherlands, uh, the migration policy there, there. It became more repressive, and a big campaign is required from women who are fighting against sexism, injustice, and racism. And we are just at the beginning of our struggle. I'm very happy. I'm very happy that we have these wonderful women here with us today. We are just waiting for everybody to put uh, in their headsets. All the people on the podium have to put on their headsets. I'm very happy that this conference is taking place and that I have the honor of being here. Now, from my side, I must say that I have learned a lot. I'm very happy to be here today. I'm really delighted about being here. I have the feeling that I have learned a lot and that this conference has enriched me. Maybe one day we might have some form of independence that will be able to fight terrorism, that will be able to change a lot, and that we can have some form of autonomous thinking, and that we can have also a lot from Asian countries, and that even in these countries that we can have some form of independent thinking. I will take the knowledge that I've gained from this conference so that I can use it in future. I have one question. I don't, I haven't seen any men here at this conference and I wish men heard what I had to say. So if the other sex, were, if the other gender hears our ideas, our thoughts, maybe they would change things because they are the ones who are creating discrimination because they are discriminating against their families. Many of these men from these countries are slaves. If you look at it from the gender perspective, 
and maybe they would change the perspective if they had been here. Yesterday, I said something about fellow Afghans. I said something about Afghanistan. I said that Afghanistan has the problem of ignorance, really, not having knowledge. That did not, that comment did, was not directed against Afghanistan, or I don't want to divide Afghanistan and Kurdistan. I just wanted to address a general problem. And I want to apologize, really. Please, believe me, I really treasure you all. And I don't care who's coming from Afghanistan or Kurdistan. We are all human beings. I really hope that one day we have the power to work hand in hand against all forms of racism, that we achieve some form of independence in the thinking of men, and that we all realize that we are just human beings and there's no difference between men and women. I would like to thank the group from Hamburg that sent me here. I'm very happy to be here. I will speak in English. Thank you very much for the inputs. They all have been very interesting. I just want to say one brief comment. What I found a little bit problematic was that uh, it was very German. A lot of things were taken for granted. They uh, things things that have been said were very context-related uh, and very connected to the German context, and I would have liked more context. Maybe you can just tell us what you mean. For example, examples about books, that uh, book tips, and these books were only referring to, or these books could only be understood by people who've been socialized in Germans or talking about the Constitution then maybe that also presupposes that people know about uh, the distribution of powers in Germany. Or talking about GDR and also uh, the Federal Republic of Germany. These things are not very um, common to people. People are not who are outside of the German context don't know these things. But let me come to a question. Let me come to my question. I think the term migration background in using it, I find it quite problematic. And I find it problematic for those who are criticizing it, yet using it. Now my question is, what do we want to use instead? We are saying that we don't want to use it. Nevertheless, we keep using it. And that, for me, is somewhat counterproductive, especially if we see that in Germany, it is very problematic to speak about race, and somewhat then we try to speak about migration background and not uh, the issues that we need to address. Okay, let's continue with the questions. We have 18 minutes. So this was a question to Peggy, and Peggy will answer this question, and then we continue taking questions from the floor. S Sylvia, and also here, people at the front. So basically, let's start with, with the answer from Peggy regarding the first question. I don't have the answer. But thank you very much for your feedback. Of course, we it's common to have contexts that are not accessible to everybody. And there, where we can, of course, we should try to expand that context. Let me say something about the books. 
books called Frank, Frank and Irene and Frank and the Captain. I don't know who read that book. It's possibly just me, because I found that book horrible. Th these book titles were just examples of East German authors, children authors, really. And these books were portrayed on the cover with white, blonde children and did not offer anything to me as a black German girl in East Germany. I am sure, very much sure, that my sisters in West Germany have other examples. Now, Roots, on the other hand, is an important book, and I can only recommend um, it to everybody who knows that. It's the family story or history of an African-American family in the U.S. This family conducted its own research and found out things in order to make it usable for their own biography. They rediscovered things. Now, they looked at biographies, which did not only date back to, to slavery, but even to pre-slavery times. Now, now, why am I saying slavery in converted terms? Slavery is not a natural process. It's an act of violence that is imposed on people. So enslavement is maybe possibly the better term referring to that kind of atrocity. So the family history goes back to Ghana, and it's about the collective survival that reaches up to the present date. And now, what was important for me was the empowerment moment and to look at what means collective survival and collective resistance. Now let me come back to East and West Germany. These are constructs, be, constructs between capitalism and socialism. These are constructs that uh, existed between 1949 up to 1990. And just one more comment, especially when we look at institutional racism. A lot of negotiations were made, or, or and also a lot has been done to really analyze the trauma of the Second World War for it not to be too painful for white Germans. However, it was very painful for the other groups, especially when it comes to racism. A lot has been passed on without any fragmentations. In West Germany, people were saying, well, we looked at uh, racism. We have done our analysis. It's basically in East Germany, which they didn't do their homework. And in East Germany, they were saying that, well, racism, anti-Semitism, that has nothing to do with us. This is, uh, these are phenomena happening in West Germany. So we are still dealing with deep-rooted uh, racism in our societies. Hello, ich, I'm going to speak in German. I would like to add something briefly. You mentioned Something I don't know how you formulated it, you know, state-oriented violence and racism, and the state has a lot of powers. And what is very important are the mass media. I remember last year with AFD and Pegida, these two, this is the first one being a, an extreme right-wing party, and the second, and a right-wing 
group, the way they were portrayed in the media, I think that this picture is so nice. This issue of uh, having a voice that is really sounding low and sounding very strong. And this is the way the media have proceeded. We have a lot of illegal radios and illegal newspapers. The media landscape has changed with the social media. I'm not so much familiar with the social media. And you have the strategies of the media just to put, to make something big and to almost silence something at the movement. I thank you so much as well from all, from the deep of my heart. I would like to thank you for this beautiful conference. You only have five minutes left. Your contribution and you and Sylvia's. Uh, did I press the right button? Yes. So to begin with, I would like to say that I'm so happy to be together with so many women. Okay. The conclusions are very interesting. Two things um, I bear in mind. First, you talked a lot of, about racism and migration, but not so much about classes, as if we ha would not have understood completely or properly the whole movement. And we talked about issues, but not so much about trade unions. This is a topic that has been neglected. Where in Western organization, where are the trade unions and the issue of class? How do you locate it? I would like uh, to slow down. In, the in a global context, racism is on the upsurge. You see what Trump is doing. I'm coming from Turkey. I'm very much familiar with the issue of racism. I know what it means. There are a lot of racist attacks, and the, there's also a racist environment. But having a look at the global context, we can see that we have a development of conservative forces, which and they are ta taking an hegemonic position. And in this tension, between anti-racist movement, anti-hegemonic movement, how are we locating, which kind of movement are we developing? I'm also somebody who has higher education and at the same time I'm in the asylum proceeding and I'm at the same time confronted in a very deep way by racism. Yes, um, emotions are overwhelming me. It's very difficult to talk about it. As, so what I'm experiencing here is very bureaucratic, very polite, in a very polite way, but also very much racist. And knowing about the strong anchorage of racism in Turkey, how is it possible to look to the to further development here? I would like to thank you all for your contributions. I would like to say something, something that I've missed in our exchange. 
We are migrants, but we don't live on a desert island. We are living within the context of a particular society. What I missed is the political situation in Germany right at this moment. Because there is a direct vinculation to the issue of racism. I'm not only talking about Germany, but about Europe. Right at this moment, we are witnesses the development of racist extreme right-wing parties and an observer it not only in Germany but also in other countries in Europe. That is uh, the upset of uh, upcoming racist and extreme right-wing movements. This is something that is very precise and that can be observed. And we have to think about the future. It will, it's going to be become worse, certainly. We have these extreme right-wing parties, and if we do not, if we are not careful, in four or five years, maybe, they will be part of government. That is terrible. What kind of, ter of, a terrible, of terrible prospects? But we have to analyze the situation, to reflect on it, I wanted to make this comment because uh, this has been a little bit missing. I thank you. I think we have to round up. We have to round up. I would like to observe, to respect really the organizations. I'm so unhappy to, cut, to have to cut you down abruptly, but we are tired, we have to eat, and we would really love to be brought around up. We are all here, and I think that your question is going to be addressed to. Maybe it would be possible to have a very brief feedback self-organization and state, if the international anti-racist feminist movement organize themselves, I think we will make move forward. Migration as a movement as well. And the state has its also roles, its role to play, but we want to have a new definition or a redefinition of citizenship to be all inclusive. So very, very briefly, the issue of class, social classes, trade unions, that is a very important issue. We have to put it forward all the time in you. And it's, I'm, thank, I'm very thankful for your question because we have to reflect on it. It's absolutely necessary. It's of paramount importance. What about the self-organization? We talk a lot about it. Social classes plays a role, including within, within and outside the trade unions. There were huge movements in both Germanys, and you do not know a lot about it. it. That shows the hegemonic character of our knowledge. What I'm working on is also an attempt to, at the Vernal Institute, at the Bulls Foundation, 1968, Six, 50, 50 years, we're going to hear a lot about it next year, and in March 2018, we are going to see which color the sh shoes, the sports shoes of uh, Fischer, Fischer is a leading, uh, uh, is a leader of the Green Party. Man, wo sind deren Geschichten? And 
these are exactly these kind of uh, stories about the resistance movement. Our feminist sisters were already there, were active, and we want to tell these stories. And next year, we want to include it. What is going to show as well how important it is and how important they are. This discussion about class, social classes, about trade unions. So if you know somebody, please come to me. We are going to join hands and to include it in this project. I too would like to thank you for the question on class. This is an important aspect. However, I believe that when we talk about racism, in particular also how we speak about racism during this conference, class always played a role, especially when we spoke about the role of guest workers and the contract workers in East Germany, but also when we speak about refugees and uh, when we realize in what form of labor they are integrated, class always played or plays a role in the history of migrants. Therefore, the um, phenomenon of class has always been present also at this conference. Racist uh, imageries, for example, when migrants are divided between useful and not so useful migrants. And if you m people are reduced just to their uh, labor power, this always plays uh, also into racism. You can't understand racism without uh, also addressing the class issue. This is just something I wanted also to highlight. I'll just be very, very brief, and I subscribe to that, what my previous speakers have said, that implicitly class is mentioned and also inscribed in societal uh, conditions and also in the economy. And Nancy, when it comes to uh, the current situation, I can totally say that, of course, it's about our presence, but in this panel, we actually Try, we actually try to look at best practice uh, examples in history where are the resistant moments which we can learn from tomorrow. Aisha, let's try to get a final comment from you. Okay, let's accept that it's not working. We cannot be able to listen to Aisha. And now let me thank my panelists. Thank you, Aurora. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you, all of you. So we're now going to go into our lunch break, and we can continue our discussion in the breaks in the next panel and so on.